Good morning and welcome to Castlefields Church this Sunday morning, 23rd of August. And what a joy it was in the week for some of us at least to meet together uh, physically uh, around the Lord's table to hold communion together. Not everybody uh, could be there, we understand that, but what a joy it was to see each other's faces and to meet together. We've been hearing this week about a number of different churches going through all sorts of difficulties uh, in trying to come back together uh, physically. At one church where uh, they are uh, taking the service on the ground floor and having to relay it to the first floor. At another church I was hearing about where people are sat in the corridors uh, behind one another. Another one using a tent uh, for their services. And uh, dear friends not very far away here in Derbyshire are not allowed to go back uh, to their building uh, and uh, meeting in a village hall about 10 miles away from where they normally meet. Even a large church we were hearing of, uh, where it depends where you are in the alphabetical order of your surname, uh, you get invited to come to church once every three weeks. Well, these are difficult days, aren't they? Uh, and please pray. Uh, pray for us at Castlefields uh, as we hope at the end of October uh, to find a possible solution uh, for us meeting together physically. We would relish that, wouldn't we? And then pray about a new building. That's a longer term project, but please pray, won't you, for wisdom uh, for us, uh, that we might know the right things to do in God's will for us. Well, for this service, we're going to come to God together in prayer. Let's pray. Oh Lord, our God and our loving Heavenly Father, how we thank you this morning that you have come to your temple God comes to his temple, the Almighty Father. And we thank you, Lord, that that temple is not a temple made with hands. We're going to learn about that this morning. It is the temple of your people. Uh, Lord, we thank you that you meet with your people. Great promises you have made to meet with us. And we thank you, Lord, that by your spirit, the spirit of the Lord Jesus Christ, who is in the midst of us, we can worship you. Help us to do that, we pray, in spirit and in truth. In spirit, because we want our worship to be alive and living and real. And in truth, because we long to know the truth of God and proclaim it far and wide. So please forgive us our sins once again, we pray as we commit ourselves to you. Cleanse our hands and our hearts, like the psalmist says so that we might worship you aright. And although we're not physically together, although we're in this virtual way and we're in homes, maybe some of us are sharing a home today to watch this service. Uh, please, Lord, we pray, give us that sense of unity together in the gospel. So we commit everything to you, ask you to bless each one of us, uh, we do pray. And those uh, scattered far and wide who we love and pray for, even in different countries of this world. And those watching who perhaps don't normally join with us, we thank you for each one, and especially for the church family at Castlefields Church, who you by your providence have brought together for such a time as this. May we love one another and care for one another and serve you wholeheartedly with one another, we pray, in unity of heart and mind and physically too. So we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, two hymns have been sent out to you if you're regulars with us and uh, they're on the website for you to have a look at on the notes and articles page. So perhaps you'll pause this recording in a moment and sing that first hymn. God is in his temple among his people. That's a great Trinitarian him talking about God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit. And then I'm going to hand over to Lee, who's going to talk to the children for us. And Lee is going to read as well in the scriptures from Acts 17 and verses 14 to 34. So we'll hand over to you, Lee. Thanks. Hello, everyone. I hope you're all OK and that you're having a good summer. 
we've just got back from our summer holiday we went away for a couple of weeks to wales and we had a lovely time there and during our time in wales we climbed two mountains in the first week we climbed mount snowden and then in the second week we climbed this mountain here Kader idris now the day we decided to climb Kader idris it was a beautiful day it was very hot it was very sunny we were all a little bit sweaty but it was worth it because this mountain it's nearly 900 meters high the views you got climbing up it and at the top were absolutely fantastic they were stunning views here are some pictures that we took as we were climbing up and it was it was a great day i'm not going to lie we were all ready to get back to the cars and have a drink and have a rest at the end of it but it was a really really good walk why do i mention kata idris well, today I want to talk about a young girl who was born and who lived very, very close to that mountain over 200 years ago. And her name was Mary Jones. And Mary Jones grew up loving to hear the Bible read when she went to church. But Bibles were very expensive in those days and hard to get your hands on. So she didn't have her own Bible. And what's more, as a young child she couldn't read either so even if she'd had a bible she wouldn't have been able to read it for herself but when she was nine a school opened in a town very close to where she lived and mary used to go to that school and she learned how to read but she was desperate to have a bible in the welsh language that she could read for herself and so for six long years, she did lots of jobs, she worked hard, she saved her money so that she'd be able to have her own Bible. Now, I don't know about you children, sometimes we save up for all sorts of things. We save up for gadgets and for technology and for teddies and whatever else. But have you ever saved up for a Bible? Has that been important to you? Well, it was to Mary Jones, and she saved up for this Bible. Now, when she got to the age of 15, she heard that there was somebody who had some Bibles available for sale in a place called Bala. Now, Bala was about 25 miles away from where she lived. On our map here, you can see, well, first of all, this is where she was born and where she was raised. I'm not even going to try and pronounce this big, long name here because I'll make a complete mess of it. Maybe somebody can speak Welsh uh, in the congregation and could, and could say that more clearly. But that's where she was born and where she grew up. And there it is on the map. You can see Kader Idris there that I was talking about at the beginning. And she heard that there were Bibles available 25 miles away in Bala. And she decided she wanted to go to Bala to get her hands on a Bible. And she decided she was going to walk all the way to Bala. It'd be like you getting up in the morning and deciding I'm going to walk from Derby to Leicester. An amazing distance, really, that she was thinking of walking. But that's what she did. And she set off and she went on this long walk all the way to Bala. And eventually she got there. She got to Bala. After what must have been a hard and difficult walk, she got there and she found a man called Thomas Charles, who was the man with the Bibles. And she asked for a Bible. Now, we're not quite sure. There's different versions of the story at this point. Some people think that Mr. Charles had no Bibles left and the last one he had, which he was going to give to somebody else, he decided to give it to Mary Jones instead. Some think that she actually had to stay for a couple of days with Thomas Charles waiting for a delivery of other Bibles. But eventually she got a Bible. Thomas Charles was able to give her one. And this teenage girl was able to head home rejoicing because she finally had her own version of the Bible in the Welsh language. And Thomas Charles, he was so moved by Mary's determination to get a Bible, he wondered how many other boys and girls and, and mums and dads around the world wanted a copy of God's Word. And he and some others started something called the British and Foreign Bible Society to provide copies of the Bible for everyone who wanted one. 
and actually just over 100 years after that organization had been formed, they'd given out 200 million copies of the Bible to people who wanted them. Mary herself, she died in 1864. She was in her 80s when she finally died. And the Bible uh, that she had got from Thomas Charles, here's, here's an image of it. It's kept in the Bible Society's archive at Cambridge University. And about four years ago, it was actually brought from the archive and it was brought to Bala for people to actually be able to see it and to look at it. Mary Jones was desperate, wasn't she? She was determined to have a copy of the Bible. She was so determined. She saved it for six years. She was willing to walk 25 miles to get her hands on one. And it's a real challenge to you and to me this morning. Because I wonder how important is the Bible, God's word, God speaking to us in the Bible, how important is that Bible to us? I'm sure none of us have to travel 25 miles to get one. I'm sure we've if, if not all of us, most of us have got our own copy of the Bible. But how desperate are we to read it? How desperate are you at the start of a day and at the end of a day to get your hands on your Bible and to read what God has to say to you? Maybe if we're being honest, sometimes we say, actually, I have no real interest in the Bible and I'm very slow to look at it. Well, let's be challenged by Mary Jones and let, let's ask God to help us to have a real desire to read his word, the Bible, to understand it, to learn more about God, to learn about the way of salvation which is offered in the Bible so that we can be right with God. Let's make it our aim to be more desperate and determined to get hold of our Bibles and to read them. There's a verse in the Bible in Psalm 119, verse 105, your word, the Bible is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. And our prayer is that would be the case for all of us, that God's word would be what guides us in our lives on the path that we go on from day to day. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that it is your holy word, which is truth. We thank you that it is freely available to us in our country. We thank you for the way in which it's been preserved over many, many years. And Lord God, we pray that we would have a determination and a desire to read your word, Lord, to learn more of you and who you are and of your greatness. And Lord, we pray that you would forgive us for when we are slow to pick up your, your word, the Bible. Forgive us for when we have uh, very little interest in reading it and we're so busy doing other things. Lord God, challenge us by the determination which Mary Jones showed all those years ago. Help us to love your word, we pray. And we ask these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Now we're going to actually read from God's word. We're going to read from the Bible. And David is continuing in Acts. And we're going to be reading from Acts chapter 17. And we're going to be beginning to read at verse 14. So Acts chapter 17, beginning to read at verse 14. If you remember Paul and Silas, they've been in Berea. And some Jews from Thessalonica have come to Berea. They've stirred up the crowd, it says there, at the end of verse 13. Let's now pick up our reading of verse 14. Then immediately the brethren sent Paul away to go to the sea, but both Silas and Timothy remained there, there being Berea. So those who conducted Paul brought him to Athens, and receiving a command for Silas and Timothy to come to him with all speed, they departed. Now while Paul waited for them at Athens, his spirit was provoked within him when he saw that the city was given over to idols. Therefore, he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and with the Gentile worshippers, and in the marketplace daily with those who happened to be there. Then certain Epicurean and Stoic philosophers encountered him. And some said, what does this babbler want to say? 
Others said, he seems to be a proclaimer of foreign gods because he preached to them Jesus and the resurrection. And they took him and brought him to the Areopagus saying, may we know what this new doctrine is of which you speak? For you are bringing some strange things to our ears. Therefore, we want to know what these things mean. For all the Athenians and the foreigners who were there spent their time in nothing else but either to tell or to hear some new thing. Then Paul stood in the midst of the Areopagus and said, Men of Athens, I perceive that in all things you are very religious. For as I was passing through and considering the objects of your worship, I even found an altar with this inscription, To the unknown God. Therefore, the one who you worship without knowing, him I proclaim to you. God, who made the world and everything in it, since he is Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hands. Nor is he worshipped with men's hands as though he needed anything, since he gives to all life, breath and all things. And he has made from one blood every nation of men to dwell on all the face of the earth, and has determined their pre-appointed times and the boundaries of their dwelling, so that they should seek the Lord in the hope that they might grope for him and find him, though he is not far from each one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being, as also some of your own poets have said, for we are also his offspring. Therefore, since we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the divine nature is like gold or silver or stone, something shaped by art and man's devising. Truly, these times of ignorance God overlooked, but now commands all men everywhere to repent, because he has appointed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by the man whom he has ordained. He has given assurance of this to all by raising him from the dead. And, while they, and when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked, while others said, we will hear you again on this matter. So Paul departed from among them. However, some men joined him and believed. Among them, Dionysius, the Areopagite, a woman named Damaris, and others with them. Amen. Thank you, Lee. As children, haven't we been uh, so excited to see different ones uh, taking our children's talk Sunday by Sunday? And they've been great. We have really benefited from them. Thank you to those who've done them for us. And children, I want you to listen very carefully uh, this week to the, to the message which I'm going to preach in a few moments, because there are some clues and helps there for you to complete your uh, sheet, your junior learning together sheet this morning. There's some tricky questions on there, so I hope that you'll be able to do them. If you're listening and watching with a family, then go onto the website, you can print that off. Please turn with me then to Acts chapter 17, where Lee read for us earlier on. And we're in Athens. Athens uh, is a popular tourist destination today, isn't it? Before the coronavirus pandemic, that certainly was the case. Uh, it would be full of people from all over the world coming to see the sites. Athens today is a, a huge modern city, about three and a half million uh, population, uh, capital, of course, of Greece. What brings people to that city is its history, uh, its ancient buildings and monuments. And uh, children, you can see there's a picture there of the Parthenon and the Acropolis. What a picture that is. You can show it to mum and dad. Uh, and you can see the amazing buildings that are still there right from the time of the Apostle Paul. 
people come for its culture and its philosophy and its art. Well, when Paul stepped ashore and walked into Athens, uh, having made that journey down the coast from uh, Berea, he wasn't a tourist, was he? No, uh, he was a fugitive. Look at the events in uh, chapter 17 and verses 13 to 15 that record that. Paul was a missionary. Paul was a man on a mission with the gospel, the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, the good news to preach to uh, the world. That mission had begun. Let's remind ourselves back in chapter 15 and verse 36, uh, where there was that intention to go and visit the churches that Paul and Barnabas had established in that first missionary journey. But things had moved on. They had been uh, guided to new and different places. And now Paul and his friends are in Europe and Paul on his own is in Athens. This is pioneer missionary work uh, in Europe. And here is Athens, one of the great cities in the Roman Empire. Now, in those other places, um, Paul had seen some success, hadn't he, for the gospel? Just cast your mind back to chapter 16 in Philippi. A house church had begun, chapter 16 and verse 40. We can we can see it there before he leaves. And uh, that's such an encouragement and a blessing to him to write to that church in Philippi. Then in Thessalonica, uh, in chapter 17 and verse 4, uh, there was a great multitude, a large number of people who became Christians there. And, and as they moved on to Berea, in uh, chapter 17 and verse 12, uh, there again were many who were converted, prominent people in that city. And now he's in Athens. And uh, as we've read the account together of what uh, happens there, we see right at the end in verse 34 of chapter 17. It doesn't appear there are many converts here, but let's read what it says in chapter 17, verse 34. However, some men joined him and believed. Among them was Dionysius, the Areopagite, a woman named Damaris, and others with them. That's remarkable that that man, Dionysius, should become a Christian. Why? Well, let's find out. Let's go walking through the streets of Athens uh, with the Apostle Paul. He's a foreigner. He's come from far away, uh, a different culture entirely. And as usual, the Apostle Paul, the first place he headed for was the place that he would know where he would find people who um, he could join with. The synagogue. Can you see that in verse 17? Now, how he fared there, we don't know. And we make some assumptions here, but we assume there are very few Jews in Athens. Remember, there was no synagogue in Philippi. Philippi was little Rome, wasn't it? And the Jews had been thrown out of Rome, Rome proper, and surely they'd been thrown out of Philippi. It's a wonder there's any Jews here in Athens because this was the cultural academic center for the Roman Empire. Well, we're not told about how Paul fares in, in the synagogue with the Jews because the emphasis here that Luke gives us and explains to us and tells us is that from verse 17, Paul is in the marketplace, the Agora, and he is speaking to people there. Now, last week, we learned a lot, didn't we, about her sharing the gospel with people who knew at least something about the scriptures, something about the Bible. In Acts 17 and verse 2, we, we see there that Paul reasoned from the scriptures. And we learned, didn't we, that where possible, that's a good thing to do, to reference the scriptures and to show them to people, to give the scriptures away. But what Luke records for us here is people who have little or probably zero knowledge at all of the scriptures. And I think that should interest us, shouldn't it? Because um, Athens is a pre-Christian society. They're going to receive from Paul something from the scriptures. And we today, we live in a post-Christian 
society. And it's as if we have lost the scriptures. And so there's a similarity in a sense between Athens of the first century and 21st century Derby, 21st century Great Britain, because there's not really much knowledge of the scriptures. So what we're going to do, we're going to look at uh, what dominates in these verses, and that is something about the society which Paul observed there in Athens, how it resembles our society. And we're going to think secondly about what Paul spoke into that society, how he brought the gospel there so that we might learn from those things. So let's just begin with a question. Uh, what did Paul see there in Athens that we see here in Derby, in Britain today? As Paul walked the streets of Athens, we walk, as it were, the streets of Derby or of our country, and we find a parallel. In fact, we find six parallels in both societies. Find them with me uh, in this passage. First of all, in verse 16, what we find is a culture of idols, a culture of idols. Now, while Paul waited for them at Athens, his spirit was provoked within him when he saw that the city was given over to idols. Paul's heart and his spirit was provoked, moved within him, because as he walked around that city, he saw idol after idol, and he worshipped the true and living God. And he knew that, that God's intention was that for all men and women, boys and girls, but idols are set up in direct contravention of God's requirements for men and women. Those commandments, those ten commandments back in Exodus 20, they're not given just for the Jews of old. They're given for all the world. We don't have any other gods before the true God. Nothing to replace him. And we have to make images of other things because we're to worship God. So where our devotion is, where our time goes, where our mental energy goes, all those things, all our love and attention, the word worship really includes the word to kiss in the original Greek. So what we embrace and what we kiss, other than God, replacing God is an idol. And he saw there were statues and effigies and structures and, of course, uh, that's what the tourists go and see. And um, today, Athens was a polytheistic society. Many gods. A culture of idols. Isn't that what we see today in our society? Secondly, what he saw was a people who didn't understand God. What do we see Today, we see a, a, a people who don't understand the truth about God, a people who don't understand the truth about God. Verses 17 and 18. Then he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews. But we leave the synagogue, don't we? And we go into the marketplace with the uh, those who happen to be there. Verse 18. There were certain uh, philosophers there. We'll talk about those in a moment. And they, who they encountered him. And some said, what does this babbler say? People who didn't understand what he was talking about. They said he's a babbler, this man. And the word babbler in the original is something like this. It, it, it might refer to a hen. Do you see hens um, going around picking, picking at the seed on the ground? Well, the word babbler here in the original is, is seed picker or grain picker, like a bird just picking up bits of things from all over the place. And that's how they saw Paul. They knew their philosophies and they, they, they listened to Paul and saw a bit of this and a bit of that and a bit of something else. They didn't see any coherence with what he was saying at all. In verse 19, you can see they saw it as something new, something they'd not seen before. And in verse 20, something strange. They didn't know God at all, did they? Isn't that true in our society today? Paul, at the end of verse 18, we read, clearly preached. 
the word preach there is evangelizo, which is bringing the good news. When we preach evangelistically, we preach simply and clearly and plainly. Paul did that. He preached Jesus and the resurrection, but he hadn't got a clue. Number three, a mixed bag of views on life and its meaning. A mixed bag of views on life and its meaning. Luke records for us two schools of philosophy in particular to, to, to show us what we what we see here in this society. We mentioned them, didn't we? Verse 18, certain Epicurean and Stoic philosophers encountered him. They were the people who didn't understand God. Well, who are these people? Well, if you want to really research it, put them into Google and, and have a good look. Let's try and summarise what they stood for. Uh, the Epicureans, first of all, they, they followed the teaching of a third century BC, so 350 or so years before Paul's there, um, the teachings of a man called Epicurus. And uh, his philosophy was this, really. Live to be happy. Avoid all pain and trouble if you can, just to live to be happy. It was a sort of a mild version of hedonism. Pleasure. Live to be happy. What about the Stoics? Well, they also followed a third century BC uh, philosopher, uh, a, a man uh, called Zeno. And uh, his philosophy was this, live in the moment. Here's the Epicureans, live for pleasure. Here's the Stoics, live in the moment. Go with the flow, if you like. Set your mind over matter, is what they said. So we know something about Stoicism, don't we? You know that phrase, stiff upper lip? That's Stoicism, mind over matter. Whatever happens, just go with it, go with the flow. So these two sort of dominant philosophies were there. They, they almost sort of were against each other in a way, but they, they lived in this mixed bag of thinking about what life was all about. But both of them rejected any ideas of a transcendent God. They rejected an eternal destiny. They didn't believe in life after death, either schools. They were entirely humanistic. They were man-centered and they were selfish. Living for my pleasure, living my mind over matter so that I can win through. That's what it was all about, really. Neither acknowledged an accountability to God or the holiness of God, and neither acknowledged their need of a saviour or salvation. <laughs> They're ancient philosophies, aren't they? But what's new? They're around today, aren't they? There are many Epicureans and Stoics around today. Number four, a fluid ever-changing set of beliefs. Can you see that? Verse 21. For all the Athenians and the foreigners who were there spent their time in nothing else but to tell or hear some new thing. So there, there, was, there were these schools of philosophy, but they were always willing to add bits and take bits away. It was an ever-changing set of beliefs. You see, neither of these great philosophers had written down a Bible, as it were. There was no set text. So it was the mind of man that made these things up. It was, it was reason that was God, not the re revelation of, of a scripture, of a, of a true God. We credit the Greeks, don't we, for their sort of erudite and wonderful uh, philosophy. But realistically, it was a mess. There was a shallowness. It was an ever-shifting idea set of things. Well, that's true today, isn't it? Absolutely true today. You can make up your own mind. What do you believe? Number five, 
there's a negative suspicion and reception of the gospel. A negative suspicion and reception of the gospel. Verse 19 is perhaps not what it appears to begin with. Paul, verse 17, goes into the marketplace and then engages with these different philosophers and so on and uh, proclaims the gospel, speaks of Jesus and the resurrection. You notice number verse 19, it says, they took him and brought him. And the more we read that, the more we realise this wasn't just a sort of friendly thing. Uh, come and talk with us on Mars Hill. And uh, when we look at may we, may we hear what you're talking about, Paul? That's not really a kindly sort of, yeah, let's sit down and have a chat together. We're finding here that Paul, having preached the gospel, there's a negativity, there's a suspicion in, his, in their reception of that gospel. In verse 23, it refer, it, sorry, in verse uh, uh, 22, sorry, uh, Paul is taken to the Areopagus, otherwise known as Mars Hill. Now today, the Areopagus is a title for the Greek court system, their judicial system. Now, that alone gives us a clue that this place, Mars Hill, the Areopagus, was a place where the council met. It wasn't an easygoing outdoor sort of debating place. It was almost an outdoor courtroom where the council in Athens listened to the new ideas to make a judgment on them. Some new thing. They wanted to hear what this new thing was. They wanted to bring it to book. Now, last year with London Seminary, I spent a whole day um, going through this passage in Acts 17 and listening to the different schools of thought that there have been over the years. And I'll tell you that there's been a lot of criticism of the Apostle Paul here. Some have misrepresented Paul um, at this point and called him a syncretist. What does that mean? Well, we know the word synchronization, don't we? Where things go together. A syncretist is somebody who puts things together. And the accusation is in verses 23 and 24, uh, where Paul is explaining to this council uh, how he was looking at all the objects of worship and even this uh, uh, altar to the unknown God that he says, uh, I'm going to proclaim him to you, that Paul is aligning himself with these philosophers. And he has a gospel that allows for other religious views and other ways to God, conceding that they were worshipping the unknown God. And that's the God that he was going to talk about, that they were already worshipping God in some way that is not in accordance with scripture. But that is entirely wrong. We must see scripture as God's inspired word. We must see here what Paul does and says to counter this negative suspicion and rejection of the gospel. Paul is effectively on trial. Not with sticks and stones and the mob. He's not going to be thrown in prison like he was with Silas in Philippi and uh, his feet put in stocks. But he is up against it here in Athens. And in verse 20, there is an antagonism expressed there. Can you see it? For you are bringing some strange things to our ears. Therefore, we want to know what you're talking about. In verse 18, they say he seems to be preaching a foreign God. And let's remember that this is not Athens of three centuries before this is Athens of AD 51 under Roman rule under Caesar's control and if you preached anything other than Caesar is 
God and King, you were in trouble. We've seen that, haven't we? Back in uh, verse 7 of chapter 17, back in Thessalonica, Jason has harboured them. And these are all acting contrary to the decrees of Caesar, saying there is another king, Jesus. So don't uh, have the impression that Paul is easygoing, chatting away with these philosophers and saying, yes, well, you know, you could be worshipping God without really knowing it. Not at all. He's not a syncretist. There's an antagonism towards him. And there will be when you explain the gospel and tell the gospel to others. Here's the sixth thing, the last thing, a fear of offending the accepted order. So going around the streets of, of Athens and examining the things that we see here, there's a fear of offending the accepted order of things. Not a fear in Paul, but you had to go along with these various philosophies. Look at verse 22. Paul stood in the midst of the Areopagus and said, Men of Athens, I perceive that in all things you are very religious. The authorised version says superstitious. Let me say somebody's religious today. Well, that's, that's quite a good thing in a sense, isn't it? They've got some moral ethical code. But when we say they're superstitious, that's all that's slightly different, isn't it? And it's probably a better word to use because the original word that Paul uses here is a word which has two parts to it. One is the part of the word fear and the other is demon. He says, I, I see that you fear or you worship things that are inspired by demons. Paul is saying they're idol worshippers. He's exposing their idolatry. And even this altar to the unknown God is an idolatrous altar. And what he says is this. There is a God. The God. And I'm going to proclaim him to you. He uses the same word Luke does here as in Acts 17 and verse 3, which is shown as the word preach there. And we've seen it. It's Catangelo, which is to clearly, very deliberately, plainly tell him to you. He's going against the order of things. Paul is standing up and standing out in this society as being completely different with a God that is completely different to anything that they know and teach. Now, we've examined through what's happening here, what that society was like. J just, just think of our society today. Isn't our society full of idols? Idolatry today is the worship of money or sport or fame, celebrity, career. Uh, it's, it's, it's the love above everything else of the work we do, the houses we have, the cars we own. It's a culture full of idols. Secondly, we said it was a people who don't understand God. And it's true. Some of you do open air work. Others of us talk to young children and so on in schools. And we can see that people don't understand God. They don't know God at all. We said it's a mixed bag of views on life and its meaning. And we've said there are Epicureans today and Stoics today. What a mixed bag of things that people think about and believe in and have as their philosophy for life. It's a fluid and ever changing set of beliefs. And it is, isn't it? The thing is with the Bible, it's a set text. Here it is. It doesn't change. It's solid. It's true. It's reliable. But everything that we see in society today that people believe in is changing all the time. We mentioned how we it's a negative suspicion and rejection of the gospel. And it is, isn't it? People don't want to know the gospel. There's a there is an antagonism and a rejection of Christianity um, today uh, and that fear of offending the accepted order. Oh, we better be politically correct here. Um, you know, we're told, aren't we, that uh, 
you can identify as a as a man or a woman, depending upon how you feel about those things. You can believe this thing and that thing. We better just not um, uh, sort of go against the accepted order. And that's how people are today. So there is pre-Christian society in Athens. Here is post-Christian society in our country. They're somewhat the same, aren't they? What then should we proclaim? This word katangelo, Paul proclaimed, he declared, he preached, he very clearly stated the gospel against that backdrop of those beliefs. Well, here we have what Paul says. And uh, maybe you're watching uh, this uh, service today. Uh, and you're not a Christian, and perhaps you've identified with um, something of what we've said. Uh, well, listen carefully to what the gospel is, what God is like, uh, that you might come to know him. And those of us who are Christians who, who would stand with Paul uh, and say that the Lord Jesus Christ has died for me, and I, I stand side by side with the Apostle Paul, then here are things for us to learn about how clear we should be in our society, what we say and what we believe and how we live it out. Walk down these verses with me from verse 24, and we're going to find out a number of things that Paul clearly proclaimed. Here's the first one in verse 24. God is. God is. Can you see how Paul begins when he speaks? His first word, God in Greek, theos. Theos. Not polytheos, not many gods, but the God. The God who never changes, the God of Bible revelation, the unchanging immutable, perfect, eternal God. And you know, when we talk to people today, people say, well, I believe in God. It's a good thing to ask this question. Tell me about the God that you believe in. Ask them that question. Tell me about the God you believe in. And you will find that the God of the Muslim is very different to the God of the Bible and the God of the Hindu. Is very good, different to the God of the Bible and the God of people with no religion, but with some idea of God. They'll tell you things about God which will make you gasp. And we need to then say, can I tell you about God? Can I tell you about what God says about God? Because people have all sorts of ideas of what God is like. That's how Paul began. God, Theos. I'm going to tell you about the God. Here's the second thing. God, this God, is to be worshipped. This God is to be worshipped. This word worship comes in verse 23, doesn't it? For as I was passing through and considering the objects of your worship, so he's he's talking about their worship and the altar that he's seen for, about the unknown God. And verse 25, he talks about God, the God, about worship of God. He's not worshipped with men's hands, with any of these different altars and idols and so on. But he is worshipped. He is worshipped. What he's saying is this. God is, and God alone is to be worshipped. Worship is to be in one direction only, to the true God. We mentioned, haven't we, that the word worship includes the word to kiss. It, 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 it really means coming towards to kiss. Who do we kiss? We kiss the ones we love, the ones we love dearly. And we love God, this true God. And this is what man is made for. What is man here for? The Epicurean said pleasure. The Stoic said to get through. But the Bible tells us 
that we are here for the glory of God to worship him and love him. I think it's John Piper who said these words, evangelism exists because worship doesn't. That's a telling statement, isn't it? Why are we, why are we preaching the gospel, telling the gospel to people? It's because that which we are meant to be doing, made for, is not happening. And we long to tell men and women, boys and girls, the way to come to that right place in life, to put God first and to worship him. What else must we be clear about? Well, here's the third thing. God is creator. This God, the God who we worship, is creator. Verse 24. God who made the world and everything in it. We are to state very clearly that truth. It's foundational to everything. We can't have evolution and the rest of the Bible. Genesis 1, 2 and 3 are the foundation that God made the world in six days from nothing. He made it. Evolution is a lie. It's an attempt to get rid of God. But Paul set out, hasn't he, to state God, the God who is, the God who is to be worshipped, is the creator God. Then the fourth thing is this, that God is Lord. God is Lord, verse 24. God who made the world and everything in it, since he is Lord of heaven and earth. The word Lord there in the Greek is kurios, which means master or king. The one who rules over those who are servants and who come to him and are dependent upon him. We've already said, haven't we? That's a dangerous message to preach. The bravery of the Apostle Paul here uh, must be noted because he's saying he's Lord, which means this. Caesar's not Lord. Maybe there was a gasp of astonishment when he said these words. But what he's saying is this. All authority and ultimate authority is vested in this God, this true God. Number five. God is giver of all. God is giver of all. Verse 25. He's, he, nor is he worshipped with men's hands as though he needed anything, since he gives to all life, breath and all things. This God needs nothing because he made everything. He has everything and what we have he gives even the breath we breathe. You may be listening to this and you may never have considered these things before, but the next breath that you breathe is given by God. It's not you living for pleasure. It's not you sort of saying, I'm going to stoically carry on through life, whatever happens. It's understanding that God has given you life and breath and everything that you have. Number six, God is sovereign. God is sovereign, verse 26. He's made from one blood every nation of men to dwell on the face of the earth. And he's determined their pre-appointed times and the boundaries of their dwellings. This God is all-knowing. He is all-seeing as well as all-creating. And he's all-determining. You see those words there, making, determining, pre-appointing, setting boundaries. What it's telling us is this, that God is ultimately sovereign over all things. Number seven, God is near. God is near. Verse 27. So that they, that's, that's people that God has made, should seek the Lord in the hope that they might grope for him or struggle for him. Seek him and try and find him, though he is not far from each one of us. What he's declaring here is that God, this God is so great and glorious, transcendent and sovereign and king and Lord, yet he is near to us. And we know that we know that he came near to us in the Lord Jesus Christ in that in he sent his son to become a man just like us. He knows you and he, he knows me. And in that sense, God is near. God is not far removed. 
God can become our friend. Isn't that amazing? God becomes our shepherd. He becomes our guide. Talk to other people of other religions about those sort of things. They're totally unknown to them. But God, this God, the God of the Bible, comes near to us. Paul knows that every man, you see, has a sense of God. We meet people who say, oh, there's no God. I don't believe in a God. Well, ask them this question. Have you ever prayed? Oh, never. Wait a minute. Have you ever been in a desperate situation and, and said something like this? Oh, God. You see, there's something inside every one of us that knows there is a God. Now, that was a totally foreign concept to the Athenian. A totally different view of what a God was. God was a lump of stone or a, a, a metaphysical being or someone, uh, something out there, as it were, totally removed from us. But Paul says, no, the God that I preach to you, you can know. In fact, you're actually searching for him now and he can be found. Number eight, God is our life giver. God is our life giver. Verse 28. For in him we live and move and have our being, as some of your own poets have said, for we are also his offspring. We've said that God gives us life. But what Paul is doing here, he's taking something of their philosophy, their mixed up, mixed bag philosophy. And he's quoting two of their poets. He actually quotes their poets back to them. The first is uh, Epinimides who actually wrote these words. So here they are in scripture, inspired by God, and yet they are, they're actually the words of a Athenian poet. In him we live and move and have our being. The poet is sort of saying that there's somebody out there, could there be somebody out there in whom we live and move and have our being? And Paul says, yes, God, that's God. And people have a vague notion, don't they, that, uh, you know, that God is sort of like the father of everything. You know, uh, he's a father of everyone. Well, one of their poets, Aratus, Aratus, he said this, we are his offspring. He also had a, a sort of a poetical vision of a, of a God who perhaps was the father of all and we were his offspring. And Paul is saying, although you're way off being on many things, you're coming near here to understanding of what I'm telling you, that there is a God who gives us life and breath and all things. And he is the father of all, having done that. And there's something about God in every one of us. God is our life giver. Number nine, God is unique. God is unique. Unique means totally different from any other. Verse 29. Therefore, since we are the offspring of God, we are, he says, the offspring of God. We ought not to think that the divine nature is like gold or silver or stone or something shaped by art and man's devising. You see, they had all these things and many of these things people go as tourists today to go and see and look at. Representations of what they thought were the gods. What Paul is saying here is really, although he doesn't actually say it, is, is God, is spirit, is He's not represented by anything made with hands. You can't represent God with something that he gave you in the first place. You, you can only represent part of him. You can't represent the whole of him. He's unique. He's entirely different. He is nothing like the gods that you worship. And that's true today, isn't it? God is not like worshipping as we do or careers or our homes or our family or our, our possessions this god is unique and wonderful glorious number 10 god is holy god is holy verse 30 truly these times of of ignorance god overlooked it says in the authorized version he winked at or in other words he he blinked and didn't see well what he's saying is this that God has allowed all our unbelief and all our rejection and suspicion of him to go on. But God is a loving God. 
And he sends this loving command to repent. And we heard from Richard last Sunday evening what repentance is. He said this, didn't he? That at its absolute basic, repentance is a change of mind. He gave us an analogy, didn't he, of going up north on the M1 and realising we're going the wrong way. What do we have to do? We have to go to the roundabout and turn around and come back in a different way. And what God requires of us is repentance and faith and trust in him because he is holy. Atheism, Athenian atheism, had no concept of sin. And all this, although the Stoic tried to sort of live a moral code, it had no reference point whatsoever. But in the scriptures, in God, we have a reference point of holiness and a need, therefore, to realise our sinfulness and to turn from that and go in an entirely different direction. And he's going to tell us why in our 11th point, God is judge of all. Verse 31. He's appointed a day. There's a day coming in which he would judge the world in righteousness because he's a righteous, holy God by the man whom he has ordained. He's given us he's given us a, a proof of this because this man has been raised from the dead. He's going back, isn't he, and talking here about Jesus. who have been talking about in the marketplace. who have been raised from the dead. He's judge of all. God has a moral code. Because God is ultimately moral. God is perfect. And God has sent a perfect, perfectly moral man into this world. The Jesus that Paul is preaching. And that man will be the judge. We, we won't be standing there looking at our next door neighbour or the person we work with or our friend and saying, hmm, I'm better than them, so I think I'm going to be OK. No, we are going to be judged against the perfect righteousness of a man, a particular man, a special man, a unique man, the man Jesus. That's going to be the standard on which we're judged. Number 12, and lastly, God is the giver of new life, eternal life life. Back in verse 31 again, here Paul refers to the resurrection, the resurrection from the dead of the Lord Jesus Christ. The key evidence, the key evidence of this man Jesus. The key evidence that there will be a heaven and a resurrection for those who are saved, whose sins are forgiven, and the key evidence that there will be a judgment for those who, like all of us, will be judged against the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Paul builds on his preaching. That's what preaching does. Preaching builds. It's logical. We've been talked in previous weeks about the logic of the gospel. And Paul in the marketplace preached about Jesus and the resurrection. That's what got all these people going in the first place. And now Paul is setting out his ground, coming back again to Jesus and the resurrection. He is preaching Jesus Christ here. He has preached Jesus all the way through. Because as we go through those 12 points, we can see, can't we, with the whole of scripture in front of us, that Jesus is God, that he is to be worshipped, that he is the creator, that he is Lord. He, Jesus, is the giver of all. He is sovereign. He is near. He came near to us and can be near to us. He is our life giver. He is unique. No other man like this man. He is holy, ultimately the representation of God to men and women, boys and girls. Our faith is to be in him. We are to repent towards him. He is to be our judge. It will be Jesus that will stand at the last day and judge the world. And he is the one who rose from the dead and can give us new life in him. Now, when Paul got to that point, Paul has built up what he's saying. There's a logic and an order to it. 
It is based on truth, not some notions of some philosophers, but on the truth of God's word and on the truth of God himself. And Paul gets to that whole matter of death and judgment and resurrection and new life. And they stop him. They stop him because there they mock him. That's where unbelief is. Unbelief stops at a need for a saviour, at judgment and at life eternal or death eternal. What they're saying is this. We want to stick with our dead gods. We don't want your living God. Isn't that perverse and foolish? Now, I don't know who you are, who, who you're watching this. You're maybe not a Christian. I, I just challenge you. What are your gods? Where are your gods? Because you've got more than one God. You've got all sorts of gods. But Paul is telling you, the scriptures are telling you, I'm telling you there is one God. And you are made to worship him. And you need that God. You need that God who has come to you in this Lord Jesus, this man who is one day going to judge you. But today can be your saviour, your friend, your shepherd and your guide. You see, on that day, some were moved, weren't they? Some were moved. But you see what they do in verse 32. They say, oh, we'll hear you again about this. You know, you don't switch off this this recording and just sort of think, oh, well, I'll, I'll give it some attention sometime. That's not good enough. We do not know what tomorrow might bring. We may be swept into eternity. No, we must be like these two who are named here. It's wonderful, isn't it? One's a man and one's a woman. The woman is Damaris. Some believed, it says. Not many, not many. Some believed. Paul is content wherever he goes to leave the outcome of his declaration of the gospel with God. And when we've witnessed to our friends and so on, we must leave it with God. And Paul did here. He moved on from Athens. But there were some who believed. This lady called Damaris, we don't know anything about her. But we do know something about this man, Dionysius. Can you see what it says about him in verse 32? He was an Areopagite. He was one of those on the council. He was one of those set against Paul. He was one of those who said to Paul, you better come with us before the council. We want to hear what you're going to say. We're going to judge what you're going to say. He got a preconceived notion that he was going to reject this new, this uh, new and strange God. But in fact, the words went to his heart and he believed. And in heaven, there was a man called Dionysius who heard Paul preach this gospel and was saved that day. Maybe in heaven, there's somebody whose name I don't know, but it's your name. And you will be in heaven because you have heard this gospel. You see, pre-Christian Athens, so like post-Christian Britain. But the gospel's just the same. Your need is just the same. And the saviour. Is just the same. Would you turn around, go a different way, and believe in Jesus Christ and come to know God? Our last hymn is O oh, Worship the King, All Glorious Above. What a hymn to finish with that speaks of the God that Paul was speaking of. Please sing it or Read it through and I'll pray. Lord, how we thank you for the clarity of the Apostle Paul here in this situation in Athens hundreds of years ago. But may this clarity from your word speak to every heart. And maybe we've been Christians for a long time, but it's given us a reminder of who God is. May we be clear in our own minds so that we might live out and speak out this God. And we commit every hearer and watcher to you just now. And pray for your blessing in Jesus' name. 
Amen.